Hi everyone, welcome back to the show. I'm so excited to introduce my guest today. Her name's Melaine Lee. She's a wealth mindset coach who works with thousands of women over the past six years. She supports women in cultivating the courage and inner soul wisdom to embark on a journey to sustainable wealth and abundance. In the past six years, Melaine has cultivated millions in her business and supported thousands of women to hit six figures, multi six figures and beyond. Her total jam is supporting women in being able to fully root into their feminine energy whilst harnessing the masculine energy to create their unique wealth alchemy. Thank you so much for joining us, Melaine. So excited to be here, Sarah. Thanks for having me. I love these kind of conversations. Yeah, I owe a lot to Melaine. I worked for her for a couple of years in the beginning of my coaching business and She's incredible and she's been a massive support to me. And I'm, I'm, I know a lot about the way that she works and her story. So she's super inspiring. And I'm really, really mm-hmm. excited to talk, talk and dive into your story today. So um, why don't you kick this off by sharing how you got to being a wealth coach and doing the work that you do today? Yeah, that's so good. Um, so I would say the story goes back probably around eight years now you see me looking up in the air because I'm just counting the years, but it was back in 2013 when I decided to go into recovery for my eating disorder and really just change my life. You know, it wasn't like, oh, I want to find my purpose work. I want to make more money. I was like, I just want to live a really good life. And right now I'm not like, I know that I'm struggling. And that was that first I like to say the first area that was really bleeding for me that I noticed the most was my health and wellness. And so really tending to that put me on this journey and this path to exploring what was possible in my life. Right. And so if I, if I don't start there, then there would never be my business. There would never be wealth coaching. There would never be any of these things. And so, you know, starting back and starting all the way back in 2013, that's when I kind of embarked on this new journey and this quest of what's life, what can I do? And, you know, something that scared me the most during the time that I was like really in the throes of my eating disorder was the fact that I would never live up to my potential. It was not, oh, you might die from this. It was, what if I never actually access my full potential? And so that really had me embark on getting healthy. And that journey led me to the personal development world, the transformational world. And the first workshop I took, I immediately fell in love with the environment, the experience, the people. And for the first time in my life, I finally was like, this is it. Like, this is what I want to do. This is this is my thing. I'm, I'm getting chills as I'm even saying it. Like, I want to be a life coach. And I didn't really know the area of expertise or how it would unfold, but I knew that I wanted to be in that arena more. And so I started volunteering a lot and I started doing tons of transformational work, workshops, training to be tr- a trainer and coach certifications and all the different things. And, and then I got asked by that same company that I had attended in 2013, um, and in, and a little bit of 2014 in 2014, if I would come work for them. And so I did, I went and worked for them and that's kind of the, where my, the trajectory of becoming a coach started to happen. And so I stepped into that role in 2015, I left them and started my own company Uh, Well, I got fired. I probably wouldn't have left because the job was very cushy. The pay was really great. There was benefits, you know, and so I wasn't really looking to leave. I had an idea of starting a business, but I was going to do it the safe and logical way. And then I got thrown out because of, you know, some really, you know, not even to go into that story was really silly. The reason why they fired me was over semantics and stuff that didn't even matter But for me, it was a clear sign that it was time for me to start my own thing, to really step into that fully. And that's where that took off. And I wasn't a wealth and business coach from the get-go because as Sarah knows, I'm someone that's super in integrity. So I always say, teach from the experience that you have. And so what I was helping people do was get into radical alignment with themselves, meaning, you know, tending to those different areas that needed nourishment, whether it be with their eating disorder. I helped a lot of people navigating that or whether it be with, you know, other areas of their life that I had expertise in. And what I started to find over those first, you know, uh, year 
or so was that I was supporting a lot of people and stepping into their value and their worth. And then as a result, they were manifesting a lot of money. I was supporting them and stepping into their value and worth. And as a result, and and getting into alignment, as a result, they were stepping into their dream career or starting their business. And that's really when I kind of tweaked my niche into the wealth mindset and business alignment coaching and really supporting people starting their businesses uh, with their wealth mindset, et cetera. And it's just evolved over the years. And it's, it's fun. You know, I think that when I first started it, what I saw a lack of was a lack, especially in women, of owning their worth and their value. And thus, as a result, not getting paid their value and not having the courage to ask for it. Yeah, I'm, I I love your work and it's a topic that I'm really passionate about as well. And just, yeah, asking for the money that you want and raising your rates and it's the only mm. way we're going to close this wage gap, right? Yeah, <laughs> um, totally. You just have to ask. <laughs> and um, I, I was working with you at the time you had, I think it was when you had Jack, when you had yeah. like a crazy year and your business was just exploding around the same time that you had given birth. And I found that really inspiring. And it really showed to me, you know, you can have it all, you can be a mother and, you know, have a really thriving business. So I would love for you to tell us a little bit about um, your experience being in business and being a mom, um, particularly, you know, around the period where you give birth and how you've navigated that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really great point, Sarah. And, and I was thinking about, you know, before coming on this interview and knowing that there was probably going to be different questions asked. And I was thinking about that. Wow. Like my first million dollar year was the same year that I also gave birth to my son, which for a lot of people would be like, what, like, how did you ramp it up? But I really didn't, it wasn't that I was ramping it up. It's just that I had a lot of creativity flowing through me and I gave myself full permission to allow that to come through, which is, I really believe the result of the income that came out was because I didn't make myself wrong for wanting to produce the things I wanted to produce. I didn't make myself wrong for wanting to work. I didn't make myself wrong for the way I wanted to set my lifestyle up. And I think what happens as a mother is that mothers make themselves wrong for the way they do things, meaning since I'm a mom, I can only work X amount of hours, or since I'm a mom, I can only do it this way, or I can only, and they start to really box things up, or I have to take maternity leave for this long, or I have to have this, and I have to have that, and so, you know, as I'm speaking to you guys, I'm pregnant with my third, and expecting him in a couple of months, and what I've learned by this this round is people say to me, how long will you be on maternity leave, and I say, I don't know, maybe a couple months, maybe not. It just depends on how I feel because I give myself full permission to do and be and create when it comes through. And that was that first year that I really allowed that to happen. And what I will also say is that I'm really big, and I I think you know this about me, but obviously your audience might not, is that I'm all about support and I'm all about creating the support and the tribe around you so that you can really reside in your zone of genius and channel whatever it is that needs to come in and through you. And when you're really like that vessel that is fully connected with the divine, creating from that infinite space, of course you're going to receive an infinite amount of abundance, finances, all the things, but it's really, it's really being in a space of allowing the support in, which is a receiving practice. And the same as when we can allow all that support in, then we're getting in the habit of allowing all of that finance and all of that wealth in, because it's all about receiving. And so I found that that year I asked for the most support I'd ever asked for before. I requested things that I never requested before. And thus my, my worth and my value was like, I'm a queen. I'm worthy of, you know, it was the first time I had like a housekeeper and I've always had a cleaner, but now the cleaner was coming twice a week and we were having meal delivery service and we had a sitter and my husband wasn't working. You know, it was like all these. And then my dad came down and was helping us with like all the things. And so we were just in this abundance of support And so it really allowed me to reside in this queen kind of state 
that now is kind of my, and now is my normal, but for then it was the first time stepping into it. And what I will say is that as the years have gone on, what I've learned is to really just keep staying in that space of what is Queen Mulane? What, what would Queen Mulane do? You know, and for whoever's listening in, king or queen, you know, giving yourself that title because you are royalty and asking, well, if I'm royalty, would a queen be, would she seat herself last? Would she serve herself last? Would she not give herself full permission to speak? Would she, you know, and, and I, almost, and I think about it with the really controversial um, issue that came out or interview, I should say, that came out with Meghan and Harry, right? And you would think like, oh, the queen's going to respond immediately. And she took days to respond, which is very indicative of a queen because the queen's like, yes, there, there is a situation. And I will respond in my time because after all, I'm the queen, you know? And I was like, well, how ro- how regal of her. Like, of course, she's going to take her time to respond, you know, like whether or not you like her, or you don't. It's just the, the, the nature and the essence and the being of royalty that um, really intrigued me. Like, oh, she takes her time because it's on her time, not on anyone else's time, regardless of what the situation is. So that was quite fascinating for me. And so what I, what I invite you guys is really like tapping into that queen or that king and asking like, what is that version of me doing each day? Because that, when you step into that space, that gives you access to that next level wealth and income that you're desiring to do because it encompasses boundaries and all the different things. I love that so much. And I think it's like what you're describing is the antidote to people pleasing which I feel yeah. is the way that women, you know, tend to fall into these patterns, particularly when you're sensitive and just, yeah, that role of, like you say, serving everybody else first, because that's just either a way that we've been conditioned or it's just a way that we've learned to feel comfortable. Um, so I love that. I love how you've like framed that. And I'm curious to, about that transition moment for you. Like what really changed when the giving birth Like what was the before and the after that giving birth really allowed you to access that, that flow? Cause it sounds like that's something that you have just continued to, um, to live with since you accessed it. Like, I'm curious a little bit about the kind of before and the afters. Mm, Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great question. I've never been asked that before, but I, I would say like the difference between the before and after was like before I was trying to figure it out. Like I was trying to figure out how do I get there though? Oh, you be it or you embody. And I'm like, "Eh, whatever. I don't, but how, like, what is the steps? You know, tell me the way, show me the steps, show me the way. And it really got me frustrated because I was so in my head about it. And after giving birth, I I believe because it's such an embodied experience giving birth, you really have to be in your body and, and it's just such a somatic experience and so, so much more than a somatic experience It's very divine and euphoric and all the things. And, um, after giving birth, I just felt you also just realize, um, this doesn't actually matter. Like nothing actually matters. I don't care if I ever become wealthy. I don't care if I have a thousand clients. I don't care anymore. I just want to be in flow and I want to be in me. I want to be authentic. I want to be real. I want to be raw. I don't, I'm not going to worry about it anymore. Like that starts to go away because you start to realize that your priorities, I think, shift and, and you really just step into this space. Well, I, I have to say that, you know, for each person, it's likely different. So for me, the experience was I stepped into this space of just fully embodying who I, who I am and really getting clear on making the decision that, yes, I am the millionaire. I am the multimillionaire. I own the empire but I'm not going to worry about it anymore. I'm not going to try to figure it out. I'm just going to allow it to happen. And I remember in June, because I gave birth in April and in June that year, I started kind of coming back to work a little bit. And I was listening to like a Grant Cardone thing. And he's like very masculine, obviously. He's a man, but he's also very masculine in all his 
uh, tools and things like that. And I was just listening to him and I wasn't really executing the tools. I was just listening and feeling into what he was saying. One of the things that he said was like, just make the decision, just decide that that's who you're going to be and stay in that space. And for whatever reason, like that really landed in my body. And I was like, yeah, I'm just going to be that person. And for the first time I was able to finally access, because I've been told it so many times before. And I think the difference was I was finally able to access stepping into that new state of being and identity of like, yeah, I am that person. And I had this moment where I was in the shower, like crying in gratitude for all of the money that was flowing into me. And that was before the money actually came in. And I was just, I had this like really euphoric experience of, oh my God, it's all going to happen. And then that year everything did. And I, I actually just had a similar experience uh, a couple of weeks ago where I was on a walk and I saw myself on a stage with like millions of people and I just started crying and I'm like, oh, I'm so grateful that I have all these things. So I think here's the key with that. What I'm saying is that a lot of people are in the space of I desire, I want, I hope, I dream, I'm wishing for, and it keeps that thing separate. And so it's really getting to a space of like, I already have it. Like I already, it's already done before I've asked for it. It's already been given to me and really getting into that embodied state of, yeah, it's mine. It's done. It's, it's already happened and getting into the gratitude of it. And the funny thing is, you know, probably a lot of you already have heard this or know about it. It's not this revolutionary thing that I'm saying, but that's really the key component of allowing it to be activated in your reality is fully embodying it and being in the space of gratitude for the thing that you want as though you have it already. And that's what I was able to start accessing after giving birth. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I heard another way of phrasing it the other day that kind of sounds like what you're saying, which is that when you have a vision for something, it's like, it's already, it's already done. Like trust your visions. I think a lot of, a lot of us will have a vision for something and then we'll like hope or we'll doubt or we'll fear that it won't happen or we'll wonder if it will happen but really trusting, like when you can see something, when you have a desire for something, when you can identify something clearly, that that already, the fact that it already exists as your vision is a big signpost. So what you're talking about is kind of like receiving that vision and, and claiming it and, and really trusting it. Yeah. Yeah. And creating the space for it to come in, you know, so like when I, when I had them, I was in the shower. So a lot of us have those shower moments And the second, like the most recent time, now I've had other times that it's happened, but I'm talking about this next level experience where I'm fully just like, oh my God, it's here. Um, I was just on a walk without any music, just walking and being. And in those spaces, that's when whoever you call your higher power, divine source, God, universe, et cetera, can actually plant the message or the vision or the thing so that you can be in that embodied space. So it's creating the space to allow that to come through. Yes. I love that. That was one of the key things that, that you taught me from working with you. Um, I'm so grateful for. (laughs) And um, like, what are some of the other key areas that you see a lot of women getting hung up around in money that you wish they didn't? (laughs) Oh, that's a loaded question. It's a loaded gun. Um, Or that you wish wish more people knew. Oh, you know, I think that people really buy into their bullshit a lot, you know? And I think one of the things that they buy into is this conversation of being so busy. You know, I'm so busy. I have so much going on. I'm so busy. Look at me. I'm so busy. I'm so busy. As though it's like a badge of honor. And, you know, today, just as an example, I have this amazing interview with Sarah and then I have one client call and then I have nothing until I pick up my kids and it literally just says rest, you know, and I have a lot of days where it's like rest, nap, relax, whatever. And I have a lot of space in my schedule and I'm so proud of what 
I'm proud of that. You know, I'm so proud of my looking at my schedule and going, oh, there's so much space. Whereas other people might think, well, that's so counterproductive. Like you're not doing anything. How are you getting things done, et cetera? And so actually the things that are the most needle moving activities in your life, the ones that create the biggest results, the ones that are the most productive for you don't actually take you all day. Like there's been studies done for people that go to work eight hours and they don't actually work those full eight hours. You know, they're taking coffee breaks or they're going to the bathroom or they're scrolling Facebook and they're doing all these things. They're not actually productive for those eight solid hours. So uh, what I find is that a lot of people are selling themselves this BS that is all around, I'm busy. And they're wearing it as this badge of honor, especially women. I'm doing all the things. I'm being all the things. Look at me. How great am I? And actually, that's just really blocking you from next level receiving. And instead of being in that space of like, I'm busy, catch yourself next time you say that and go, wait what am I not prioritizing? You know, I actually have a lot of my clients like call themselves out on this. I say, say it out loud. Instead of saying, I'm busy, I can't do that. Say, that's not a priority. You know, going to that event isn't a priority. And then you can go, oh my God, but it is a priority for me. Or taking on that next client isn't a priority. Or going to this, you know, um, this interview isn't a priority, you know? So it's looking at the things that you're doing right now, maybe doing a brain dump of all the things that you're doing that are keeping you quote unquote busy and then going, hey, what are actually the needle moving activities? What are What is actually producing the results that I want? And two, what are, what are, what are the priorities? You know, um, about a month ago, I had a little bit of a health scare that everything ended up being okay, but... Um, during the pregnancy, everything's fine now. But at the time, what I really, uh, what I saw it as is uh, an opportunity to get really vigilant again around my boundaries and around my schedule and around what I was allowing in. And so like, I'm giving you this exercise and I'm sharing this with you and it's a work in progress. It's something that you have to check in because even myself, I'll have all this space and then I'll find things start to kind of slip in and they start to, you know, oh yeah, I'll take that call. Oh, I'll take that call. I'll do that. And the next thing I know, my calendar's full again. And so I just wiped everything out. And I said to my assistant, get your pen out because we're going to have to make some phone calls because I'm not doing any of this stuff this week. And it felt so good. So it's really looking at your calendar and going, What's the priority and what's just busy work? You know, people say, well, I'm not getting the results that I want and I'm doing all these things. Just because you're doing all the things doesn't mean you're going to get a result. It's about doing the things that are actually producing the results and creating space so that you have that divine guidance and inspiration coming through. So I think one of the things that can be not frustrating, but I'm just like, come on, ladies, is that conversation around I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. Or the conversation around capacity. I just can't hold it. I don't have a big enough plate. I don't have the capacity. And I'm like, well, if you don't have the capacity to hold whatever it is you're t- complaining about, you're. why would the universe give you more money? So of course you're not going to get more money because the universe thinks that you're in overwhelm. And so it's reprioritizing, reorganizing, and getting into a space where you can open up to receive on higher levels and I really, and, and getting out of those conversations of capacity and overwhelm and busyness and, and getting into a space of what are the needle moving activities? What actually produces the results? And how can I, getting into the conversation of how do I create more space in my life? I love it. Yeah. Boundaries is just everything and it's a constant renegotiation. And I think also when you refer to you, how the needle moving activities don't actually need to take that much time. Like that's a confidence thing, which is all about connecting to the identity, which is what you've been talking about. When we connect yeah. to that and we're super focused and we believe in it, then we're able to execute in like actually a very small amount of time. And yeah, business doesn't need to take that much time to create epic results. Totally. I, I think like my needle moving activities probably take me an hour a day. Like they really, there really aren't it doesn't take a lot of time. You know, I was just last night I said, oh, you know what I'm going to do this little special offer. Like this idea just came through as I was sitting on the couch 
And it was like, yeah, just send the message to these 10 people. And then this morning I woke up and six of them were like, yeah, yeah, yep, 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 yep. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. You know, and people are like, oh, you have to do all these things and I have to do a launch and I have to do a this and I have to do a that. And it's like, those are all just stories that you've identified with, beliefs that you've identified with that you think you need to do in order to yield the result. But if you just create the space and lean back and go, you know, show me like where, lead me, guide me, show me universe, what tool do I need to access as opposed to trying to do all the tools and focus on the one that comes through or folk. And if you're like, oh, that isn't really coming up for me. It's like, well, writing out all the stuff that you've ever done and what are the, what are the tools that are actually producing the biggest results for you? Amazing. Thank you so much for coming and sharing all of your wisdom with us today. Where can people find out more about your work? So welcome, Sarah. And it's been a pleasure chatting with you. And anybody that wants to find more out about my work and all the things, you can go to Malanely Butler. And that I'm sure when Sarah puts this out, you'll see my name. So it's just my name on all the handles on Instagram, Facebook, uh, MalanelyButler.com. So you'll find everything there on Clubhouse, all the platforms I'm on. And it's the same name. Amazing. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for watching and listening. Please leave a review, like, subscribe and share and support the show and see you next time. Thanks, Elaine. Bye. Bye. For more inspirational content, head over to my website with and please support the show by liking, commenting and subscribing.